If we buy into, and I admit that not all people do, that we are first and foremost relational beings, <clears throat> then everything we're doing, no matter philosophically, epistemologically, ontologically, uh, by any criteria, if it's the other, it's also relational. So the question is, how do we talk about that? Uh, how do we recognize that we are engaged as constructionists in a very different language game than modernists? So in a modernist worldview, we're looking for uh, veracity, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what did I discover, etc. And so hearing about a relational approach from, if you occupy that modernist space, you hear it as this is the truth, not the modernist view. And that's why I say we're in a different language game, because we're not talking about truth. We're talking about a recognition that we, that, that the process between people and also between people and their environments, all that embodied action is the most important thing for us to focus on. And when we focus only on the individual, we tend to find ourselves, as we do today, uh, in an evaluative, judgmental, pathologizing way of being in the world where this is normal and that's not. Um, you need a medication, but you don't. Uh, you need remedial work in school, but you don't. And, and instead, you know, it's, so, it's quite easy to treat an individual. You can put an individual in jail. You can give an individual a medication. You can, you know, send an individual to a reformative program. But changing an institution, changing the ways in which we relate at the, the broader level, of how we talk with each other, how we think about our lives, how we do education, for example, how we do healthcare, how we do um, anything, organizational life, community life. Thinking at that level is exhausting, to be honest, and it's a lot of work. But my own belief is that that's, that's where we need to be focused. So and when I think about what is relational thinking, it is so much broader than just you know the the uh, interpersonal dynamic, and at the same time we have to realize that it's the interpersonal dynamic what we do together every day, with each other in our environments in particular contexts around particular issues. It is those interactions that create these beliefs, which we come to call institutions or dominant discourses. So, uh, for example, the, you know, if I ask you, why did you do that, and you say, because that's the way it's done, then we know that you're just tapping into an institutional way of being or what I would call and many others would call a dominant discourse in this unreflexive way, never questioning and never recognizing your own fingerprints. Every time you know we say something like, I'll use a banal example, um, all children should go to school. Okay, why? Because that's what they should do. Okay, as we do that and send our children to school, we are maintaining the fact that that way of talking, that way of being in the world, remains unquestioned. So what we need to do, I think, and what relational thinking helps us to do is kind of remember the connection between these micro interactions that we engage in with each other and in the environment and how they create the macro. And then the macro reflexively you know, loops back to influence the ways that we engage at the micro level. So it's this you know, continual looping and if we don't engage in some kind of um, internal dialogue, reflexive critique, uh, we just take it for granted that this is the way the world is. So 
relational thinking also invites us into this space of of reflexivity, which I think, you know, um, I'm hesitant to say there's a bottom line to these because that's a very modernist idea. But if there is like a pervasive notion that, that I think we need to hold on to, it is this idea of reflexivity. It's, it's different from reflection. You know, you can reflect on a conversation. Oh, that was a nice conversation I had with this person. Oh, yes, that meeting went really well. That's reflection. Reflexivity is really interrogating oneself, if you will. Um, was there something else I could have done in that moment? How did I contribute to creating that strong difference of opinion that we had, that argument or that good time? It doesn't matter. What could I have done differently? What might I do the next time? That's reflexivity. And we do not train people to do that. That's we are utterly unreflexive and the answer, you know, why did you do that is because that's the way it's done. So the work we have to do is showing people that their banal interactions, their everyday interactions really are important and they really matter and they are connected to these larger issues like social injustice uh, of all forms, you know, racism, sexism, uh, educational inequality, etc., uh, that we're part of that. And so then the other part of that is to say, oh my gosh, that is incredibly overwhelming. Like, am I supposed to change the world? Uh, so um, I think that we can be overwhelmed by that. But if we realize that and don't jump to, I have to solve all the world's problems, but to the question of what can I do at the micro level, where is, in Gregory Bateson's terms, the difference that makes a difference? What are these small changes that I might be able to engage and perform to try to co-create with others something different? Uh, you know, we tend to bifurcate and say, so we have this tradition of modernism, uh, scientific method, uh, objectifying others, the belief that we can discover the truth and so forth, that also is a, rela a sort of relational process. It's just creating a very different kind of relationship. So in my own work, I it's really important for me to share with others and to remind myself that there's no uh, method, no form of action that's off the charts, that, that is off limits, that we can't use. That if I'm sitting with a person and through our conversation it becomes clear that they really believe behaviorism, like that's the way the world works, to the extent that I don't respond to them in that, using that discourse, that way of talking, I'm not being relational. So it's the difference here is the difference between using a particular way of acting because you believe it's the truth and it's the way things must be because this is right. That's a modernist belief. In a relational perspective, from within relational thinking, it's we act as we do in a, an attempt to be responsive to the other and to engage in a process of co-creation with the other where all resources that are available to us, acknowledging that not all resources are available to everyone, but of the resources available to any given person, any of those might be useful. But we use them not because they're the right thing to use, but because first they seem responsive to the other. And then, you know, I think that that sort of gets at this metaphor of performance and play in the sense that, um, I can think I'm being responsive to another and do something, but the, my, my actions have no meaning until the other responds. And if the response of the other inter makes my actions something completely foreign to me or not what I anticipated, I can try again. And I think that's also a, a huge difference because, uh, from a traditional point of view, because people you know, you feel like 
it reminds me of uh, the film when Harry met Sally and in the scene she says something and he says, well, it's out there, it's out there, you can't take it back. And, and um, I, I think you can, you know, you can try again and you can do it playfully or you can just do it. Um, but if you think, if you use the metaphor of this is a performance and every, everything I say or do, every bodily movement, every word or phrase uh, is an invitation to the other. And it's an invitation into a particular kind of performance. But I need you, I need the other, in order to engage that performance, to fulfill, to make, be, bring that into a reality. So if you respond in a different way, then I can draw upon other resources I have to invite you into the performance I want. And, and we're constantly negotiating because the other's responses are inviting me into something as well. And so I find this idea of performance and play so useful because it, it first of all, uh, at a very basic level, which co is like common sense, it takes us away from truth, you know, that there's a right way to, to be. But that's not the most important part of it. I, the most important part is to realize that we are creating our life stories together. And that is a performance, and it's serious play. Uh, that is, the, to use the metaphor of play can be generative, but also it's, um, it changes the way we approach each other and the way we approach problems in the world. Like what can, it, it, it kind of energizes the imagination, I would say, and gives us uh, the opportunity to think, I, I don't like this expression, but think outside of the box, you know, to sort of say, okay, like what I should typically do in this moment is this, but what if we created something different together? So maybe if I do this, we could go on in a different way instead of this predictable argument or this predictable discussion or whatever. So many people ask where the individual is in all of this. Is Are, are we completely erased and gone and missing? And um, I really like the way Ed Sampson, a psych social psychologist, talks about this. He talks about um, he talks about you know putting aside individualism that everything that makes me who I am is contained inside me. The body is just a container, and if you if you want to know who I am, you need to pry inside that container somehow get that stuff out. Um, he says no, you know that's not the way it works. Who we are emerges in our relations with others. First, second. We're in multiple relations with multiple others, so we have multiple selves. But what he says that's most useful is he talks about our specificity. And I find that for people who, you know, get a little anxious with like, what do you mean I don't have a personality or I'm not a, an individual uh, making my own choices and perf making, you know, performing in my own ways and with free agency, free will, and all, all of that kind of stuff. This idea of specificity can be kind of calming. Like, yes, you have your specificity. You are not like me. Why? Because we have different relations. We move in some similar but some different worlds. And you think about who you are as a person as a confluence, a coming together, like the coming together of multiple rivers, you know, in that, and it, it's kind of when they come together, it's a very tumultuous zone, right? Like, and that's who you are. You have all these possibilities. And so it's not a giving up of our individuality. It's actually a liberation. And um, a liberation in general, and also a liberation from having to think, oh, when I was in this conversation, that wasn't really me. I was being duplicitous. I wasn't the person I really am. Well, they're all us. And so when we think of ourselves as not being true to ourselves, not acting in the way we usually are, the question we should be asking ourselves is, whose voice is in our head? you know, observing how we're acting. Oh, well, that's someone from this community that I am part of, but this is a very different community. And I'm not being, uh, 
uh, duplicitous or untrue to myself. I have all these possibilities. So instead of seeing a movement away from self-contained individualism as a deficit, I actually see it as a, a liberating benefit, you know, that we, we can recognize and give voice to the multiple ways that we can be in the world and with others. Um, and there are lots of really good examples of that, like, you know, uh, you're in an argument with a colleague and there's a certain kind of relationship we've established and an identity we've established in that kind of relationship and in maybe in that particular uh, context, in that particular topic of conversation. But if we think about the way we talk with a child or a spouse or a good friend and bring that voice in, it actually can change the dynamic of the relationship in a generative way. So we have so many resources and uh, when we think about ourselves as these stable, unified individuals, we really limit our, ourselves in terms of what we can do. When we talk about dialogue, uh, there are a lot of problems in talking about dialogue. And one of the uh, most obvious is that it's an overused term now. And people are, you know, you see it all the time. We're having a dialogue on race. We're having a dialogue on gun control. We're having a dialogue on whatever. Um, and what that really means is we're getting together and we're going to have a conversation, you know, or a discussion among a group of interested people. That's not dialogue. Dialogue, um, I borrow John Stewart and Karen Zedeker's uh, definition of dialogue when they draw heavily on Martin Buber's work. And they say, dialogue is a tensional activity. And the tension is between holding your own ground and letting the other happen to you, as they say. So, okay, let me take a step back. In addition to the overuse colloquially of dialogue, there also is this uh, common sense understanding that dialogue means we're just all happy, we get along, you know, we can come to an agreement, and so forth. And that's why I love their definition, because it's tensional. There's a tension between holding my own ground. So first of all, in dialogue, we are acknowledging we have very strong, very passionate beliefs. We're not wishy-washy. We're not saying, oh, it's okay. You have your view. I have my view. That's all right. We're just different. No, I have my view. I really believe it passionately, and I don't want to give it up. And I think your view is wrong, is evil is immoral, anything, all of those. But in dialogue, what I recognize is that my passion for my position is also something that you have for your position. You are passionate about your position. You see your position as rational, coherent, sensible, the only right thing to do. That's what I see in mine. We are polar opposites, completely oppositional, but we share that. We share this passion for our own rationality. That's what it means to hold your own ground and let the other happen to you, that you recognize that. So now all of a sudden, I have my position and it's almost like there's just a, like this little sliver of space for yours that I don't agree with at all. But I recognize that, that, for you, that we, you're like me. You really hold on to that tightly. That kind of recognition opens up the possibility for us to be curious. I want to know now, instead of pr proving you wrong, instead of bombarding you with my ideas and accusing you and judging you and evaluating you, now I'm curious. How in the world could you possibly think that your ideas make sense, 
that they're moral, that they're okay. I need to know that. And if I ask those questions respectfully and with genuine curiosity, it's quite likely that you will return the favor. Okay. What happens as an outcome of dialogue, that to me is dialogue. I don't change my position probably, and you probably don't change yours either. I don't sanction you. I don't say it's okay. I don't think it's just or fair or right or proper. But both of us walk away from that interaction having moved dramatically from a black and white view of right and wrong to a very gray view. I don't have to accept what you say, but now I understand, at least have a beginning understanding of how it makes sense to you. I still disagree strongly, but I've never heard anybody give that rationale before for that perspective. So it's a much more complicated issue now. So um, I was just talking with a, a PhD student of mine earlier today about her research uh, with youth in um, the Middle East. And, you know, we have decades of people trying to do conflict resolution around the Israeli Palestinian issue. And nobody has succeeded. Why? Maybe resolution isn't possible. Maybe there's not a solution, an answer once and for all. And, everything will be fine. So what does relational thinking offer us? It offers us a different goal, if you will, although I don't like that word. Not resolution, not solving the problem, but can we begin to forge the possibility to have a new way of understanding? To, if you will, com complexify the issues that we have simplified to understand that these are not black and white issues, and to also understand that there's never, ever going to be a universal solution to any problem. But there are still two issues that really need to be uh, considered there. I mean, you know, yes, we want to complexify and so forth. But first, that doesn't mean anything goes. That you know, once we say, oh, OK, you know, you have your beliefs, this community has their beliefs, they're there, and now I, I don't agree with you, but I understand. It's okay, anything goes. N not at all. What we have to kind of recognize is that uh, we live in community. We communally construct what we think is just and right and fair and good and, and all of that. Um, and there are some forms of practice that we, we being, let's say, the majority of people or a community, think uh, there are some practices we think are unfair and unjust. So if we want to produce change, it's not like, OK, uh, you think killing people and terrorizing people is OK. That's your thing. I don't agree, but that's your thing. No, if we start with dialogue, we have a better chance of transforming uh, communities or people whose actions uh, seem inhumane and unjust. And the way we have to do that is in itself more humane and just, in the sense that instead of imprisoning someone, for example, uh, which we know prison does not create reform. Um, if I approach another who has done something that goes against our kind of civil code with a curiosity to understand, I have invited that person into conversation with me. And the possibility for us to co-create new understanding and new meaning together then is there where it's not if we just punish, evaluate, cut off, isolate. We need more connection. And so this is so far from an anything goes perspective. And it is so far from saying, well, I have my values. 
um, but I don't want to impose them on you. It's not about imposing. It's about trying to create the conditions if in fact our beliefs and values emerge from what we do together and also in our environments. I don't want to leave the inanimate world out of this. Um, then what we need to do is continue to find ways to, to interact so that we can create new forms of understanding. So our best way of transforming uh, any form of action that we see as uh, improper, unjust, call it what you will, we need to engage. We need to engage in dialogue and this relational uh, sensibility gives us the way to do that. Also, the second issue is the issue of, uh, of moving away from this idea, well, moving away from two things. Moving away from, as I already said, resolution. Finding the solution, solving the problem once and for all, there we go, now we're on to the next thing. That's not going to happen. And the other is to try at all costs to avoid consensus. Consensus can be okay. I, I, I need to say that sometimes that's the best we can do, but I am not a fan and I will not advocate for consensus because in cons processes of consensus, people come together and they passionately put out what they want. And then through a process of negotiation, everybody starts pulling back, you know, making concessions. Okay, not this, not that. And when people leave that process, leave that conversation, everybody thinks they gave up more than anybody else. And if you feel that way, then you are not invested in following through on the agreements that have been made. So I'm not, I don't think that's a way to move forward. I think the way to move forward is to bracket resolution, bracket consensus, and find a way to connect with the other with respect and curiosity and generous listening so that we can keep the conversation going. And in keeping the conversation going, the possibility of creating new understandings emerges.